Great to see the MLS and American soccer growing so much. Uh, the league continues to grow, our national teams and the men's. I mean, the World Cup is now bigger than the Super Bowl on a global basis. People that come in and believe in this, it's a bet on the growth of the sport. Major League Soccer is catching up to the NHL. The sport is growing rapidly in popularity. You know, things are really growing in the soccer world. It is a great time to be an MLS team. We've seen the growth of the game. The MLS could overtake Major League Baseball as America's number three sport in 10 years. It's amazing, isn't it, the growth of the game and the MLS. How close is Major League Soccer to overtaking the National Hockey League? Since 2019, the average value of Major League Soccer clubs has risen 85% to $579 million. What is driving that growth? Never before have American cities, bars, kids at recess, and even billionaires been so obsessed with soccer. Lionel Messi is reportedly close to coming to South Florida to join Inter Miami. We've been told this was bound to happen for decades now, but I want to know why it's actually true this time. Why am I seeing videos of 60,000 fans selling out games in the middle of the NBA and NHL seasons? Why is LAFC's $1 billion valuation higher than 75% of the Premier League? How did the MLS pull this off? Let me show you. If you were curious, yes, there is live music everywhere in Nashville, even the airport, which is great, but why am I in Nashville? It's a fair question. When you think Nashville, you think music, Southern culture, cowboy hats, bachelor parties, hot chicken, not major league soccer. But you should, and it's mostly because of this thing right here. Turns out Nashville is the perfect example of why soccer is finally winning in America, but the reasons why are probably not what you'd expect. And I promise you, the answer is far deeper than we were able to print Group B co-advancer shirts after the Qatar World Cup. And by the way, yes, I did impulse buy that right after we took down Iran and immediately cut the sleeves off. In all seriousness, how did a league that nearly failed several times, a league that debuted running pens, a reverse clock, salary cap, draft, and this kit, finally get its act together and steal the fans of America's biggest sports? This is truly a full circle moment for the MLS because back in 1988, America had a very different World Cup conversation going on. Now the US is set to host the World Cup again in 2026. It'll be the first time since 94, but how they convinced FIFA to host in the first place is a very strange story. They called FIFA to inquire about hosting, but it didn't go so well. FIFA laughed and told them in order to host, you need to have a national league. It's a requirement. It was an embarrassing reminder that the previous US leagues crashed and burned three years ago, but they didn't quit. The US realized everything is negotiable with FIFA, so they countered. They offered to build a brand new league from the ground up just to host this one massive tournament. They pitched it as the MLS and FIFA was intrigued. They knew the US had the largest sports market in the world and boom, just like that, the MLS was born but didn't actually kick off until two years after the 94 World Cup, which is weird, but FIFA didn't seem to mind. They were in because the idea was, even though Americans really don't care for soccer, the sport will grow because they'll all get to experience firsthand just how amazing the game is on the world stage. Didn't go like that, like not even a little bit at first. In the early years, the MLS was more like a really expensive side hustle than professional league. 10 clubs dotted the states and things went south almost immediately, both figuratively and literally. League execs weren't really seeing the growth or traction they wanted, but instead of making changes to the clubs that were already in place, they settled on adding more. Florida received its second club, Miami Fusion, and Chicago received the fire. Shockingly, fixing their club problem with more clubs didn't work, especially in Florida. Both these clubs folded in a matter of years as the league shrunk from 12 back to 10. All in, the MLS lost $250 million in the first five years and found itself laying on its deathbed. Attendance was dangerously low, bankruptcy was lurking, and the entire world was laughing at the ridiculous Americanized rules. The MLS was down bad in a time when sports were surging in America. They looked at the NFL and they were like, you know what? 
let's just fire our commissioner and hire one of their guys. More specifically, this guy, Don Garber, who came aboard as MLS Commission in 1999. He paved the way for this beauty right here, the largest soccer-specific stadium in the United States, Nashville's Geodas Park. Garber understood that if this thing was going to survive, there were three things that were completely non-negotiable. Adopting world rules, which he did immediately, developing homegrown talent, and building homes for MLS clubs. Now, number three is a big reason why I'm here today to show you the difference between going to a match in an NFL stadium and a soccer-specific stadium like this one. Remember when I said attendance was dangerously low? It had dropped 20% since the league began and Garber was having none of it. The MLS was averaging about 15,000 fans per match, but it was a quiet 15. Clubs played mostly at NFL stadiums, which are designed for 60,000. What is this? Imagine walking to a massive bar with your buddies and you see 50 people inside. Then imagine walking to a smaller bar, like this one, with 50 people inside. The smaller one is going to have more energy every single time. That's the same problem the MLS was facing, which is why Garber pushed hard for the Columbus crew to build their own soccer-specific venue, which opened in 99. It was all about first impressions. New fans need an exciting experience to become repeat fans, especially if they're going to raise their kids as fans. Thankfully for everyone who wanted to see the league not die, the Crew Stadium was a hit and it wasn't just fans in Columbus that loved it. Other billionaire owners were obsessed and it became a trend. By 2012, the MLS had 12 of its 19 clubs playing in soccer specific venues. Fast forward to 2022 and the stadium count grew to 22 with the newest and most ambitious being Geodas Park. It's big and it's beautiful and the team has been successful, but we need to stay in 22 for a moment because something even bigger happened. The countdown is on. Team USA is back at the World Cup. This is a young team. It's an exciting team. It's an enchanting team. I think they're awesome. They are hungry and they are so talented. The US men's team rebounded from its embarrassing absence at the 2018 World Cup by advancing into the knockout stage. Of course, we all know how much this means, but I really wanted to talk to someone who's been on the story for a long time, so I called up Justin Birnbaum from Forbes. If we fast forward and we go to the 2026 World Cup, what would you consider a win at that point? A couple things. MLS needs to send more players to the World Cup. They sent 36 players to the World Cup. That's the sixth most of any league, which is great because you're talking about the big five leagues in Europe and then MLS. And also Tiago Almeida from Atlanta United was on Argentina and he became the first active player to win the World Cup. So if you send more players to the World Cup and people are, you know, getting to know the sport, falling in love with the players and wanting to follow up on that, you know, having them come back to follow these players in MLS is a huge, huge win for them. This is what I meant by full circle. The MLS was literally founded to host the 94 World Cup and it's hosting again in 2026, except this time it isn't an extremely expensive side hustle built to please FIFA. It's a real league with passionate fans thriving in cities that we never expected to love soccer. It's gone from losing $250 million and nearly dying to clubs like LAFC being valued at over 1 billion. And now we have Messi turning down 1.3 billion from the Saudis to come play for Inter Miami. Remember Garber's second point, the one about developing homegrown talent being non-negotiable? That worked too. Even better though, it's not only homegrown talent. Slowly but surely, the MLS is losing its reputation as the retirement home for past their prime, washed up superstars, as real international talent has joined the league. The results are in and they're shocking or scary if you work for the NHL or MLB. In a poll by Statista, American sports fans were asked to select which leagues they followed. Selecting multiple was acceptable and they were all required to provide their age. Unshockingly, the NFL led the poll with 52% of fans following, but this number dips down to 33% among fans aged 16 to 25. The NBA plays second with almost identical figures among ages, which makes sense given their younger fan base. Next comes the MLB, who isn't doing great here, but given their average fan is 57 years old, the dip is less severe than expected. In fourth place was not the NHL, it was the MLS, with almost no dip at all. The NHL rounded out the top five with lower numbers than we all probably anticipated. Now, while this graph is a dream for anyone who's been bullish in American soccer, it gets better. 
This is only a snapshot of the present, which is why I mentioned the average age of MLB fans. Younger fan base equals more growth potential, and this is how they shake out. The MLB is the eldest league at 57 years old. Second oldest, the NHL at 50, the NFL comes in at 47, second youngest is the NBA at 37, and youngest of them all is the MLS at 30 years old. Now, I'd be lying if I stood here and said that everything is great, there's nothing to worry about, the growth is gonna continue forever, and the MLS will just breeze its way past the MLB and NHL. Things are good, but things are also risky. More specifically, their bet on streaming is risky. Instead of going with a traditional network like CBS or NBC, the MLS went all in and convinced Apple TV to exclusively show their matches for 250 million bucks a year. A first of its kind 10 year partnership with one of the most innovative and customer focused companies in the entire world, Apple. Even though it seems like everyone's a cord cutter, everyone is most certainly not a cord cutter. 72 million US homes have cable, and while nobody knows exactly how many subs Apple TV has, it's estimated to be about half. Are there other factors at play here? Sure, the US is becoming increasingly diverse, which naturally lends itself to more soccer fandom. The 2022 World Cup was an iconic thriller. 1.5 billion viewers it makes everyone wanna watch and play more soccer. And all these celebrities on screen right now have invested. That helps too. If you were to take all the factors I've shown and put them into a big pod and stir it up, what you're gonna be left with is the people who said for decades, soccer's gonna blow up in the US, I'm telling you, and they were right. It's been a long, windy, and treacherous road for them, but they've made it. We're here now. The World Cup is coming home, Americans love soccer, and the MLS is booming.